so I'd like to start off. This is our first Nexus for the year, so we're so excited. Um, we have with us David Peliquin, who practices law at Ropes and Gray, where he is a member of the firm's healthcare group. He focuses his practice on advising academic medical centers, life science companies, and information technology companies on issues related to human subjects research and data privacy. He frequently writes and speaks on topics related to each of these areas and is a regular presenter at conferences and webinars of the American Health Law Association, the Association for Accreditation of Human Research Protections Programs, and the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Outside of his law practice, David has, David has served as a community member on the Institutional Review Board at Mass General in Boston. David received his law degree at Yale Law School, and David clerked for the Judge Diana E. Murphy of the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. Before attending law school, David worked as a project manager for EPIC. I've had the honor to work with David on a variety of research projects over the last couple of years, and I'm honored that he is here today to share his knowledge on and expertise on GDRP. And we look forward to hearing all about it. So David, thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction and the invitation today, Marie. It's really nice to be with all of you. Um, GDPR is something I spend a lot of time counseling American hospitals, health systems, and universities about because almost all of my clients that are involved in research at some point in time are doing a research project with an institution in Europe, or they're doing a study that's sponsored by a company from Europe, or they're collaborating with somebody in the United Kingdom, and questions arise about the GDPR. Um, earlier today, I actually did a webinar for a bunch of university clients on GDPR as well, so it continues to be a frequent topic even five years after the regulation took effect. And so my goal today, I have a slide deck prepared and I'll go through that with some background on the law and give you some examples of when it applies to research activities conducted in the US. But because we're a smaller group, it looks like it's great if you guys want to unmute yourself and ask a question at any time. I enjoy answering questions live. Um, it's probably easier if you shout it out that rather than putting in the chat, because sometimes when I'm presenting, I don't see the chat right away. Um, so with that, I'm gonna share my screen. We'll see if I do this successfully and we will go through the presentation. Are you guys able to see my slide deck here? Okay, perfect. So the title today is GDPR Practical Implications for US Healthcare Researchers. And let's see if we go to the next slide. First, I'm going to talk about the jurisdictional scope of GDPR. What does that mean? Lawyers love to talk about jurisdiction, but what we really mean there is when does the GDPR reach across the Atlantic and apply to a university like A.T. Still in Missouri or Arizona, for example? That's probably the most important thing we're going to talk about today. Then we're going to talk a little bit about how data can be transferred from Europe or the United Kingdom to the U.S., then we're going to talk a little bit about the implications of the law for U.S. healthcare providers and then some steps people take to implement GDPR compliance at their institution. So if we go to our next slide here, the GDPR took effect back on May 25th, 2018, so over five years ago. And it's the data privacy law, I think as many of you know, that applies in 30 countries. That's the 27 member states of the EU and three additional countries, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway, that together with the EU make up what's called the European Economic Area, or EEA. And that's why throughout this presentation, I refer to EEA rather than EU, because it's technically the EU plus these three other countries. Um, the GDPR is a regulation that applies directly in each of these countries. Um, however, and this sometimes is a little bit frustrating, the GDPR does give each of these countries discretion to derogate, that's the word that's used in European legislation, but it basically means to make an exception from the main regulatory text in certain areas, which can lead to differences amongst the different countries in Europe. And I'll point that out as we go through like areas where the different countries in Europe can sometimes take a different approach 
And lastly, there's a lot of confusion about the United Kingdom because of Brexit. A lot of times people say like, oh, we're just doing the research with the UK, so we don't have to worry about GDPR, right? That's wrong. Because after Brexit, the United Kingdom basically copied and pasted the GDPR into national UK law. And so they apply substantially similar data protection legislation post-Brexit. There is um, some thought that the United Kingdom, now that they've Brexited, the parliament there has this idea of potentially loosening some of the restrictions on data privacy to make the UK more business friendly. That has not happened yet. And the UK has a strong incentive to maintain strict data privacy laws because they want to be seen as having equivalent laws with Europe because that's beneficial to them. So the bottom line for this audience, I think, is if somebody is doing research with the UK, you should treat it the same way as the EU or EEA from a data protection standpoint. So with that out of the way, this is just a refresher on geography about where the GDPR applies. It applies in all of the deep blue countries, which are the EU, and the green countries, which are the EEA, and then in the United Kingdom. A red country, Switzerland, does not apply the GDPR. It has its own data privacy law. Um, so if you're dealing with Switzerland, which you might be, because a lot of biopharma companies are based there, um, you need to think about Swiss law compliance. And then the gray countries are not part of the EEA, so they're not subject to GDPR. So the law, GDPR, it is concerned with personal data. In the United States, we're very familiar, I think, with protected health information. If you're dealing with health information, hospitals, health systems, PHI under HIPAA, but personal data is much broader than PHI because PHI is limited to health information. So information about a doctor, for example, is typically not PHI. Um, but personal data under GDPR are defined to include any information that relates to an identified or identifiable natural person. And that person's referred to as a data subject. Well, what makes somebody identifiable? This is a key question. Um, and someone's identifiable if they can be identified directly or indirectly by reference to any one of a number of different types of identifiers. Some are ones that we would normally think of like name or identification number. But one can also be identifiable based on their physical appearance, their mental condition, their cultural or social identity. Any of those things can make somebody identifiable under GDPR. We go to our next slide here. Um, personal data under GDPR, like I mentioned, it's not just health information. It applies to all sectors of the economy, so to online activities, to information on healthcare professionals, um, this comes up sometimes in the research context. If you're doing research with an entity in the EU um, and you're collecting information like CVs on their investigators or study staff, those individuals are data subjects under GDPR and their information, including like their CV information, their personal data, like their address where they live, their bank account information, that would all be considered you know, personal data under GDPR, even though from a HIPAA standpoint, we'd say that's not PHI because it's not health information about them. The GDPR doesn't apply if data are anonymized, but what does that mean? Anonymization is one of the more difficult concepts under GDPR, and oftentimes it becomes one of the most discussed points in any type of research collaboration between the EU and the US, because there's a question about, well, the US researchers will wanna say, well, all the data we're getting are de-identified, they're all anonymized, so why are we worried about this privacy law? But the challenge that comes up is that unlike HIPAA, under HIPAA, you know, there's well-trod pathways of de-identification where you can remove 18 identifiers, take it outside of the HIPAA privacy rule. GDPR doesn't have that same type of safe harbor remove 18 identifiers list. GDPR says to judge whether data are anonymized is what we lawyers would call a facts and circumstances test. You have to take into account all the means reasonably likely to be used, either by the controller or by another person, to identify the person directly or indirectly. So in other words, if there exists somebody in the world who can re-identify the individual, those data are often not going to be considered anonymized. Notably, pseudonymized data, that P word here, pseudonymized, um, or what are sometimes called key-coded data, where you strip off names and other direct identifiers and replace them with a code, 
those type of data generally remain personal data under GDPR. And the reason is because there exists somebody, like maybe the investigator who collected the data and coded them, who was able to re-identify them. This is generally the case, even if the recipient of those data, so let's say I'm a researcher in Arizona, I'm getting data from Austria. The Austrian researcher has coded the data and just sends me the data with codes like 123, 234, or 345, and I don't have access to the names in Arizona. The GDPR would still say I'm holding personal data, pseudonymized data. I will say that this is a matter of great debate and might change because there's litigation currently pending before the top court in Europe, the Court of Justice of the European Union, that is actually looking at this question. What's being litigated is whether pseudonymized data, a coded data set that's held by someone with no access to the key needed to re-identify the data, whether those data might be considered anonymized in the hands of the person who lacks the re-identification key. A lower court in Europe already ruled that in those cases where pseudonymized data are held by somebody who lacks the key to re-identify, that those could be treated as anonymized. But the European regulators didn't like that decision, so they've appealed the decision to the highest court in Europe, and we're awaiting a decision here, which I think is going to be very important for GDPR purposes, for thinking about researchers who may not have access to the key to the code to re-identify data. GDPR also doesn't apply if individuals are deceased, so once you're dead, you're no longer a data subject under GDPR. However, this is one of those areas where, remember I said different countries in Europe can derogate, they can take different approaches to an issue. This is one of those areas because different countries in Europe can extend the law to protect data of deceased individuals, and some of them have done that. If we go to our next slide, you may have heard of controllers and processors when you're dealing with GDPR. There's often a question about like, are you a controller? Or are you a processor? A controller is the party that alone or jointly with others determines the purposes and means of processing personal data. Um, and you could have joint controllers if one or more organizations work together to determine the purposes and means of processing personal data. There would be joint controllers. A processor is someone who's like a vendor. They process personal data on behalf of the controller, but they can't typically use it for their own purposes. They're just carrying out a set of instructions that were given to them by a controller. Both controllers and processors are regulated under the GDPR. However, controllers have far more responsibility. And we'll talk a little bit more about these later in the presentation, but they have to do things like provide notice to data subjects, respond to exercises of rights requests, like the right to be forgotten, if the data subject asks to have their data deleted or provided. They have to sometimes notify of data breaches. We'll talk all about this um, going forward. And so who's a controller and who's a processor? When we talk about research, um, in clinical research, the sponsor of a study is typically a controller because they've designed the study. They're determining how and for what purposes the personal data are processed. Um, in the context of a clinical trial, the clinical trial site may also be considered a controller because they have to typically exercise some modicum of professional discretion to carry out the study, like figuring out how to treat adverse events or assess adverse events. Processors in the context of research, that's typically like a CRO. They're not designing the study. They're carrying out the study on behalf of somebody else, the sponsor typically. A central lab is frequently treated as a processor in clinical research because they are just analyzing samples that are being directed to them by the sponsor of the study. Clinical trial sites, the reason I put a question mark here is this is another area where different countries in Europe take different positions. Um, in some countries, they're treated as processors. The United Kingdom, for example, where the National Health Service really controls most healthcare and controls clinical trials at those healthcare institutions, the NHS's position is that clinical trial sites should be treated as processors because they're just following the protocol that was given to them by the sponsor. In other countries in Europe, like Italy and Germany, there's a different approach taken because the clinical trial sites there are saying, well, we're a licensed healthcare provider. We exercise some discretion in doing the trial, like I mentioned earlier, to assess adverse events or treat adverse events. So we should be treated as a controller. So this is a debated issue in the U European economic area. 
Um, and you really have to take a case by case approach here, depending on what country you're dealing with. Now, I'd said earlier that one of the key things for US institutions to understand is when does the GDPR apply to your institution? Because when they were drafting the GDPR, <clears throat> the regulators in Europe said, well, this law isn't going to be that effective if we only confine its operation to the borders of Europe. Because data, of course, are fungible. They can be moved across borders as part of electronic technologies, for example, as part of research studies. And so we want to extend the protection of GDPR outside of Europe's borders in certain cases. But they had to define in which instances does the law extend beyond Europe, let's say, into the United States. And in doing so, they established a test for determining if GDPR applied. The GDPR will apply if one of these three things is true. First, if an organization is established in the European Economic Area or United Kingdom and processes data in the context of the establishment. What does that mean? Well, an establishment is a physical location. So let's imagine that A.T. Still University establishes a campus in the United Kingdom or in France, and you process personal data of your employees there. That would be data subject to GDPR because you have an establishment, a campus in France, that's subject to GDPR, and any data you process in the context of the establishment becomes subject to GDPR. It doesn't mean that all the data that you hold in your campus in Missouri or Arizona are subject to GDPR, but it does mean that the data on your campus in France are subject to GDPR. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. If we open an establishment in France, we're going to be subject to European Union privacy law. But there's other cases, even if you don't have an establishment in Europe or the United Kingdom, which you can be subject to GDPR. So one is if you offer goods or services to individuals in the European Economic Area or United Kingdom. What does that mean? Well, let's imagine you have online courses that you make available to physicians in Europe, and you target those to people in Europe because you say, you know, these courses are designed to allow you to become a physician in France or meet your educational requirements in France. Or we've translated some of our courses into French to enable people in Europe to take them. That would typically be seen as an offer of a good or service to people located in Europe or the United Kingdom and could be seen as subject to GDPR. If you collect the personal data of those students, let's say, in the context of offering them the online course. Also, in the context of research, you could be offering a good or service if, let's say, you create a mobile application that you're using in a research study and you make that application available on the Apple Store in France. Um, then you are offering a good or service to people located in Europe, um, and that would be subject to the GDPR. Another example is monitoring the behavior of people in Europe and the United Kingdom. Um, monitoring behavior is another independent prong. If you uh, monitor behavior of people in Europe or the UK and you collect their personal data and doing that, you're subject to GDPR. What is monitoring behavior? It typically means tracking people online through like cookies, pixels, analytics on a website or um, through some type of smart device, like uh, a fitness <clears throat> tracker or mobile application that collects information from them. Or in some cases, it might even be receiving a feed of data from an EHR to do research. That could be seen as monitoring behavior. I put a note here at the bottom, GDPR is agnostic as to the citizenship or residency of the data subject. What I mean by that is when the law first came out, a lot of people said, oh, well, you know, David, at our university, we have a lot of European employees that work here in the U.S., but they're European citizens. Do we have to worry about GDPR with those people? And the answer is no. If people have moved to the U.S. and they're working at your institution, even if they're an EU citizen, the GDPR doesn't apply to them because you wouldn't fall within these tests we just went through. Conversely, though, if you have American citizens that move to Europe, and you're offering them goods or services, you're monitoring their behavior while they're in Europe, yes, they would be, their data are protected by GDPR. So GDPR doesn't care about citizenship. It cares about, do we fall within one of these tests we just went through? David, I have a quick question. Yes, please. So we we have um, we have a program where we're, we're training some um, physicians and students, and they come from Europe, and they, um, we do collect data on them while they're here, and then they go back 
home to Italy or Germany or wherever they're from. So would would that be subject because they're citizens of Germany, but they come here for training for a week? Um, would that apply? Yeah, that's a really good question, Marie, and it's a good example. So I would argue we would go, actually, let me go back on the slide. So we would want to apply this test of we're not established in Europe for purposes of this program, as I understand it. Like all the operations are in the U.S. These people are getting on a plane and coming here. The question would be, I assume, are you collecting information from them before they get on the plane and come here to register for the, the program or something? Um, that's a Dr. Degenhardt question. <laughs> <clears throat> well, for any type of conference, you know, people, you know, sign up, they enroll to be a that, Of course, yeah. So the question would be, are you targeting people in Europe for this program? In other words, are you targeting it to people in Germany or people in Europe somehow by translating into their languages, accepting payment in their currency, um, or making statements about if you take our course, it'll help you meet the requirements in Germany. If you're targeting it toward Europe, then the data that you're collecting while people are in Europe may be subject to GDPR. But if it's just a general program, like we have a program that's open to physicians anywhere in the world, and you need to have a osteopathy degree or whatever to come and be part of the program, um, then I think you'd have an argument it's not subject to GDPR because there's no intention to target Europe. There's an element of intentionality here. And so in the guidance on the territorial scope of GDPR, the European Data Protection Board has given an example that I think is helpful to your case, Marie, where they give the example of a university in Switzerland. Remember, Switzerland was that country on our map that's not part of the European Union, not subject to GDPR. So they posit that there's a Swiss university that has a master's program. And to join the master's program, you need to speak German and English, and you need to have an undergraduate degree. And the Swiss university advertises the program online to all comers. The guidance says that that program, the data collected by the Swiss University is not subject to GDPR because they didn't target Europe when they were making the program available. They give a second example where they say, okay, well now let's say our Swiss University still has this program. You have to speak German and English and have an undergraduate degree to join the master's program in Switzerland. But now they start advertising the program in Austria and Germany um, saying, they translate the materials for advertising into German. They distribute them in Austrian German universities. And they say, our program is accredited in Austrian Germany so that if you go through our program, you can get educational credit in those countries. Then the guidance says the data collected are subject to GDPR because there's an intent to target Europe, i.e. Germany and Austria there. So I think when you're having a program, Marie, your question is a very good one. Like when you're offering a program, you have to consider like, is this to all comers? And we take people from anywhere in the world and we're not specifically targeting Europe with this program or are we um, you know, targeting it specifically to Europe by saying this program has accreditation with your local um, you know, physician accrediting body or whatever such that you can get credit there. That, that's how I'd look at that. Does that help with the situation? And happy Does to help Dr. Degenhardt. So do you think we're subject or not? <laughs> well, it, it does definitely help. It it basically says that if people, if if we bring people come over to do a, a conference or course, as long as we don't specifically, you know, market to a region of the EEA, then we're okay, right? The issue that we have here is though, is if by taking the course, they end up, you know, uh, taking some tests. They they that we actually collect information about their performance on whatever level that might be. Is that a different scenario then? When when they come to the U.S. and they take a test here in their, in the U.S. 
that wouldn't change the analysis because the question would be, are you targeting Europe? Um, once once they fly to the US, then I would say their data aren't going to be subject to GDPR, but it's really that initial encounter with them, if you will, like online. This is how like some of my, U, my US university client, other US university clients look at this. They say like, if we're targeting European basketball players or something and our like sports outreach, then we would treat that information, their applications as subject to GDPR because we're targeting Europe in particular. Um, but if it's a general program you make available, then typically GDPR, you have an argument GDPR doesn't apply there. Thank That's you. Very good question, Marie. You get right at the heart of the complexity here. <clears throat> So what does it mean for, for, for GDPR? Um, what are the key implications for US institutions? So one, for all in instances in which you're getting data from Europe, there's an issue of cross-border data transfer that will come up and we'll talk about what that means. And then if the GDPR applies directly, so let's imagine we change the circumstances of the example we just went through, and you were targeting Europe for this program, and you were saying, we translated everything into French, we have accreditation in France, we're targeting people in France, then there were, are certain additional you know, requirements you'd have to meet about establishing a basis for processing, providing notice to data subjects, and we'll talk about that in a moment. I'm gonna start though by talking about the restrictions on cross-border transfers of personal data. Um, because this frequently comes up for researchers when you might be getting, let's say, a file of data from a hospital in France. Actually, Marie and I dealt with this in her prior role, where there was a hospital in France that was providing data to an organization in the U.S. for research, and we were figuring out, um, you know, what's the basis for the transfer of those data to the U.S. And the reason this comes up, the reason I have this big X in the middle of the slide is because Europe and the United Kingdom think the U.S. is a wild west of privacy, that we don't protect data well enough. And so they say before our data, our personal data go from Europe or the U.K. to the wild west, we need to have some protections in place. And so this comes up all the time. Like last Friday, I was representing an American hospital that was trying to get a data file from a university in Vienna, Austria. And the Austrians were saying like, well, before we give you the data to the US, we need to put in place a mechanism to safeguard those data. So this, here are some examples of how this might come up. You know, when you have a clinical trial sponsor in Europe that collects data in the US, they take it to Europe, they send it back to the US, that could be a transfer of data. Or if a US healthcare provider engages a lab in Europe to process data and let the, they transfer the data, the lab transfers data back to the US. Or you have research collaborators in Europe who transfer files of pseudonymized coded data to a US healthcare provider for research. Or if a university in Europe transfers specimens and phenotypic data to US healthcare providers for sequencing. All of these are international transfers of data that GDPR would restrict unless a legal basis for the transfer is in place. The GDPR allows data to go from Europe to other countries that have been determined to be adequate. Um, here's a list of the other countries. There are not that many of them. And the United States is not on the list, which is key for our purpose. But if you move to Argentina, data can go from Europe to Argentina, no problem. Um, in 2020, the Court of Justice of the European Union um, decided this case known as Schrems II, where they basically invalidated the previous agreement between the EU and the US for the transfer of data. Um, and what they were really concerned about is that the US intelligence gathering laws, like the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act courts, um, could basically pick up data that are held in the US without giving notice to Europeans. And the EU government didn't like that, or the EU court didn't like that. Um, and basically they said, if data are gonna to go to the US, you have to have an equivalent level of protection as they're given in the EU. Um, fortunately, things are getting a little better in this regard in that in July of this year, the European Commission, which is part of the European government and our government in the US announced the EU-US data privacy framework, which basically says that US companies can self-certify the EU-US data privacy framework with the US Department of Commerce, and then data can flow from the Europe to those companies that have self-certified. Um, the problem is that this is only available to for-profit companies, 
And so if you're part of a nonprofit institution, you're not eligible for the EU US data privacy framework. So what do you do then? Well, there's other options that are used all the time. Um, if you're dealing with a prospective research study, let's say, you could get the explicit consent of people in Europe to the transfer of their data to the US. You have to tell people that their data will be less protected when they come to the US and they're still consenting to that transfer of data. This works when you have like a clinical trial potentially where you're prospectively collecting data and consenting people. Doesn't work so well if you're getting a file of retrospective data from the EU and there's no contact with the people to get their consent. But probably the most used option is something called the standard contractual clauses, which are basically a set of contract clauses that have been approved by the European Commission. Um, and they can be entered between a European entity and a US entity. There's also a UK version of the clauses that can be used for UK institutions to US entities. And basically the clauses by contract cause the US-based entity to have to follow certain protections, safeguards on the data. And they allow data to be flown, um, shared, I should say, from Europe or the UK to the US when they're entered between a European or UK party and a US party. Um, you have to determine if it's who's a controller and who's a processor under the arrangement because there's different clauses for each scenario. You have to provide notice to data subjects that you're using these clauses in certain cases. And you have to conduct the data transfer impact assessment and basically showing how the data are still protected when they're held in the United States. Um, but this is an option that's frequently used in research um, because it eliminates reliance on consent and allows the transfer of both research subject and also clinical study personnel data, like investigator data from Europe to the US. One issue here is that if you're receiving data in the US under these contracts, and then you're gonna share the data, let's say with another institution in the US, your collaborator, um, then you typically have to flow down those requirements to the collaborator, enter the standard contractual clauses with the collaborator. And I see it looks like Dr. Roy has a question. So please ask the question. Hello, thank you. Uh, so I was wondering if this applies to aggregate data. You are just talking about pseudomized or anonymized yeah. data with mm -hmm. identifiers, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, when we say identifiers, what we mean is really line level data or individual mm -hmm. level data that are attributable to a person so that we might code the data as like subject one, two, three, four, and someone in Europe knows that subject one, two, three, four is really David Pelequin. So it's like individual level data. Okay. But when you say aggregate data, if what we are learning is that there's 50 people in Germany that have disease X and 20 people in Italy that have disease X, you know, that wouldn't typically be personal data because it's not individual data. It's not about an individual person. It's about a group of people. Hopefully that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Okay. And then when you don't have standard contractual clauses in place, there's other ways to transfer data that aren't used very often. Um, you can do if transfer based on performance of a contract in some cases. Um, in a certain very narrow cases for reasons of important public interest, you can transfer data or to establish exercise or defend legal claims. These don't come up very often, so I'm not gonna focus on them much today, but I know for completion. So everything I just talked about is relevant whenever there's a transfer of data from Europe to the United States. You have to have a legal basis in place for that transfer. If you're collaborating with an EU entity, they're often going to stick those standard contractual clauses onto the back of their contract um, because they're doing that to allow data to flow to the US. But remember earlier I said like for a US institution, a key question is whether the GDPR will apply to you directly. Because even if you're not offering goods or services in Europe or monitoring the behavior of Europe, if there's a transfer of data from Europe to the US, then you're probably going to need standard contractual clauses or another mechanism to permit that transfer, regardless of whether the GDPR applies to you directly. But if the GDPR applies to you directly because you're offering goods or services to somebody in Europe or monitoring their behavior, then there's a number of additional requirements that will be put on you beyond the transfer um, restrictions that we just talked about. And so the next slides are all about what are the implications if the GDPR is determined to apply to you directly, 
because you're offering goods or services in Europe or monitoring the behavior of people located in Europe. So that's what we'll talk about next here. <clears throat> so some of the, this is a list of all of the implications and I'll go through a few of these in more detail. And first you have to establish a basis for processing personal data and also special categories of personal data, which are things like health data. Special categories are things that are more sensitive like health data, sexual orientation, race and ethnicity. Um, you also have to provide notice to data subjects of what data is being processed, for what reasons. You have to respect data subject rights. You have to have a record of processing, vendor management, which I'll talk about, certain security requirements. Um, in some cases, appoint an EU representative or data protection officer. Um, there's something called a data protection impact assessment for high-risk processing. And then fines, that's what everybody gets everybody's attention is fines. And for violations of GDPR, that can be up to 20 million euros or 4% of your annual revenue, depending on how serious the violation is. And so GDPR has this concept that every processing activity, that is every use of personal data, every sharing of personal data, needs a grounding in the law. It needs to satisfy a legal basis in the law. Those of you who are familiar with HIPAA um, are going to understand this a little bit because under HIPAA, any use or disclosure of PHI requires a basis under the regulations, under the privacy rule. So if you're a covered entity under HIPAA, you can use PHI for treatment, payment, healthcare operations, but you need additional permission if you're going to use PHI for research, for example, like a subject authorization. GDPR is similar in that it says every use or every processing of personal data requires a legal basis in the law. Um, and those could be consent of the data subject. It could be performing a contract with the data subject. So if you're selling books, let's say some of my university clients have a bookstore, they're selling a books online to someone in Europe. They have to process their personal data to sell the book, to consummate the transaction. That could be a basis for processing personal data, performance of a contract. Um, you also can process personal data if necessary to comply with a legal obligation or if necessary for legitimate interests, which basically are interests that you as a business or nonprofit organization have in running your organization. You can use process personal data for those interests as long as they're not overridden by the fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject, which a lot of what does that mean? It means like processing data in line with the expectations of the data subject. They would expect that a university is going to use their contact information to process goods or services they order from the university to deliver um, a receipt for a donation they make for the university, but they might not expect that all of their information be used to market to them. So that's really what we're talking about here. Um, the GDPR puts a prohibition on all processing of special categories of data, which I mentioned a moment ago are things like health data, genetic data, sexual orientation, unless you can fit into an exception in the law that permits processing of those data. And this is a list of all the different special categories of data. It includes things like political opinion and trade union membership you see here at the bottom that we frequently don't think of as sensitive necessarily in the US, but in Europe, they do, I think for historical and other reasons, treat those as special sensitive categories of data. If we go to our next slide, to process these special categories of data, you need an additional permission in the law which can be getting a very explicit consent from the data subject. Um, it could be that it's necessary to process those data to establish, exercise, or defend legal claims. Um, again, for reasons of public interest in the area of public health. So for example, in a clinical trial, processing adverse events could fit within this example of where you need to ensure high standards of quality and safety of healthcare and medicinal products. If it's necessary to conduct scientific research, you can process special categories of data if allowed by EU or member state law. And this is one of those areas where different countries in Europe take different approaches about the extent to which data can be processed for research purposes without the consent of the individual. Um, so this is something to look into specific EU, um, you know, what country you're dealing with if you're wanting to rely on this basis. You can also process special categories of sensitive data when it's necessary to protect vital interests of the data subject, which is usually like a life or death situation. So this might come up with expanded access, compassionate use. I sometimes see this where data have to be provided from Europe to the US to permit a product to be provided in a life or death situation. Very unusual that this would be used outside of that context. <clears throat> 
Um, and then also sometimes for medical diagnosis or preventive or occupational medicine, um, you can process special categories of data. Another key thing about GDPR is you have to provide notice to people that tells them several details about their information. So if you collect information, let's say as part of a research study and you have an informed consent form, and then informed consent form, even if consent isn't your basis for processing the data, you typically have to tell people the identity and contact details of the controller, um, the controller's data protection officer and the EU representative, if they have an EU representative. Um, the purpose is a legal basis for processing data. So I was just going through the different legal bases for processing personal data. Well, you have to tell people in the notice you provide to them how their data or what the basis is for processing. Even though that seems really technical, you have to tell people we're relying on our legitimate interest to process your data. And we're processing your health data to ensure the safety and efficacy of medical products or something like that. You have to tell people how long you're going to store their data. You have to tell people about their rights. I'll talk about rights in a moment. Um, you have to tell people about cross-border transfers. So you would have to tell people we're going to transfer your data out of Europe to countries like the U.S. that have less stringent data protection laws. But we have put in place contractual terms to protect your data. You have to tell them how you're going to safeguard it after the transfer. Um, you have to tell people about their rights to complain to EU authorities about misuse of their data and also any automated decision-making made on the basis of their data, which might be, if let's say as a university, you have a uh, algorithm that's going to determine whether people get into the university or not. Um, you have to tell people about that. That would be automated decision-making. In the context of a clinical trial or research study, the notice is often provided as part of the informed consent process. Um, when we're talking about notice to like site staff or investigators, that's often provided as a standalone document given to them or sometimes as part of like a website privacy notice. I mentioned a moment ago that GDPR gives several rights to data subjects. Those include a right of access, a right to rectify or correct data, a right to be forgotten, a right of erasure, right to restrict processing, a right to data portability, that is to get a copy of your data in electronic format and take it from one controller to another, and a right to object to how your data are used. All of the starred items here is that are areas where the different countries in Europe are allowed to make an exception and basically make an exception that says the right doesn't apply for research purposes when data are processed for research, but that varies from one country to another. The right that got a lot of attention when GDPR first took effect is this right to erasure, a right to be forgotten. The New York Times had some stories about little newspapers in Italy that had published stories about individuals who later on were making requests that the stories be deleted under this right to be forgotten. Um, the right to erasure or right to be forgotten is not really as scary as it sounds in the research context. A lot of times researchers are saying, oh, well, if we, delete the data or honor the right to erasure, it's going to affect the integrity of the data set. Um, but you only have to respect the right of erasure if the data subject can show that you no longer need the data for the purpose for which they were processed, or consent has been withdrawn for processing, or the data subject objects to processing based on legitimate interest, or you've processed the data illegally, or you are required by law to erase it. If the data subject can't show any of those things, they don't have a right to erasure. And there's also an exception to the right of erasure when you're processing personal data for scientific or historical research purposes. If honoring the right of erasure is likely to render impossible or seriously impair the processing objective. And so if you can show, if we honor the right of erasure for David, it's going to affect the integrity of our research, um, then you don't have to give David the right of erasure. There's also um, a question about, well, what if we have pseudonymized data? Like let's say we at AT Still University have a file of coded data from Europe and somebody calls us, Pierre from Paris calls us in Arizona and says, I wanna delete my data. Well, we say, well, Pierre, we don't know who you are because we only have pseudonymized data. Um, and the GDPR accounts for this. It says you don't have to know the identity of data subjects or um, learn their identity to comply with the rights of access. Instead, you can tell Pierre, like, well, we don't know who you are, so you need to talk to the Sorbonne or your university in Paris, whoever gave us the data. Um, 
And so typically in agreements, if I'm doing a research agreement, like a clinical trial agreement with an entity in Europe, and I'm representing an American client who won't get the names of the research subjects in Europe, I put the obligation to respond to data subject requests on the European entity because they're the ones that can really vindicate that request. There's also a requirement in GDPR for something called a record of processing. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but the record of processing basically has to contain a lot of information about data subjects, um, about the types of data that you collect, the purpose for which you collect it, descriptions of the categories of data subjects. It's basically an internal register that you would have in your organization of all of the types of data that you collect that are part of GDPR. Not like individual people or names of people whose data you collect, but basically the categories of data you're collecting, how it's used, who it's shared with. Um, so if you have activities subject to GDPR, then you need to create one of these records. And if there ever were an investigation of your organization by an EU data protection regulator, they would ask to see a um, copy of the record typically. GDPR also has a concept of vendor management. So remember I said there's controllers and processors. If you're a controller of personal data, you hire a vendor to be your processor. You're supposed to do some diligence on that vendor to ensure that they um, have appropriate protections, safeguards in place to safeguard data. And you have to have a contract with them that meets certain requirements that are set out in GDPR. Um, that's called a data protection agreement or DPA typically. You'll frequently find them in vendor contracts. If you're familiar with HIPAA, you're probably familiar with business associates and the idea that you would hire a business associate, the covered entity hires a business associate that does something on its behalf of PHI. This is a very similar concept in GDPR. I'm not going to go through all of these, but this slide could be a good reference to you because it shows what has to be in the contract between the controller and the processor, the vendor. Um, and it's kind of things you would expect, like you will use the data only for the purpose we've hired you to use it for, and you'll use it if we've instructed you, and you'll safeguard it. And when the arrangement is done, you're going to delete it or return it to us unless you're required by law to keep it. And we have the right to audit you upon request to make sure you're safeguarding data appropriately. And so these are really the vendor management provisions of GDPR. There's also the idea that if you hire a processor, if you hire a vendor and then they subcontract out some of the work to a subprocessor, it would be called similar to how under HIPAA, a business associate can engage another entity as a sub business associate. Um, there are certain requirements that you need to put into the agreement um, to require that the processor um, flow down protections basically if they engage a subprocessor. And this slide basically goes through those provisions and I won't recite them all for you, but hopefully it's a good reference. A lot of times clients ask, you know, what are the security requirements of GDPR? How do we make sure we're GDPR compliant when it comes to security? Um, the GDPR does discuss appropriate technical and organizational measures, but it does so at a pretty high level. All it says is that you have to have appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk of processing. And you can take into account the types of data you're processing, the nature of the processing, the state of the art, what the risk to the data subjects is of the processing. So for example, if you're holding somebody's resume information that they included in like their NIH bio sketch, that information you know, doesn't need to be protected as much as if you're holding somebody's medical record or their health data. So it's a risk-based approach really. Um, and examples, these aren't requirements, but examples of appropriate uh, measures to protect data under GDPR are pseudonymizing the data, like replacing names with codes, encrypting data, uh, making sure that if there were like, let's say a failure of systems, you could still ensure the integrity of the data, ability to restore access to the data in a timely manner in the event of an incident, and processes for doing like penetration testing or regular testing of the data um, and the safeguards. That's all part of you know, what GDPR says should be part of a security program. If you are not established in the European Economic Area or the UK, then you process data in, you know, that's subject to GDPR, then you typically have to appoint a representative who's in the European Economic Area. And that person is what I would call a mailbox plus. That is, they are somebody who are there to receive process um, and to 
um, basically notify you if there's a complaint by an EU regulator. There's also a requirement under GDPR for a data protection officer. If the core activities of your organization um, require regular and systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale, or probably more relevant for this audience, if um, your core activities involve processing on a large scale special categories of personal data. So for example, if your core activities of a hospital require processing special categories, i.e. health data, genetic data on a large scale, then you would need a data protection officer. Um, and then there's also requirements under GDPR for notification of breaches. Just like in the United States, every state has its own law on breach notification. We frequently get mailings probably from your bank or somebody else saying your information may have been compromised in the security incident. Um, those are required under US law, under US state law typically. Under GDPR, if you have a breach, so an unauthorized use or disclosure of personal data, um, you have to notify the regulator in the relevant country within 72 hours, unless you determine it's unlikely that the breach will result in a risk to rights and freedoms of data subjects. And you also have to notify the data subjects themselves without undue delay if the personal data breach is likely to result in a high risk to data subjects' rights and freedoms. There's also something in GDPR I mentioned earlier called the Data Protection Impact Assessment. This is something that's done a lot of clients are doing this now actually with artificial intelligence. So if you're using new technologies, i.e. generative AI, that may result in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of data subjects, um, then especially if you're processing sensitive categories of data like health data, then you're required to do an analysis, the data protection impact assessment, which basically lies an exercise where you would list out what is the description of the processing you're doing, is it necessary? You evaluate whether you're, it's required for you to use the level of data that you're using. You assess the risks to rights and freedoms of data subjects. I mean, also measures, what measures you're putting in place to address the risks, like safeguards, security measures, and mechanisms to ensure protection of personal data. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the GDPR does have extensive fines. Um, depending on which provisions you violate, those fines could be up to the higher of 10 million euros or 2% of your annual turnover, which is annual turnover is really a European term for revenue, or fines up the higher of 20 million euros or 4% of your worldwide annual turnover. And GDPR also has a private right of action on data subjects, and they can bring damages claims directly against your organization if you're subject to GDPR and you violate the terms of GDPR. So that's really all the um, remarks I had prepared today, but it looks like we have a few minutes left. So I'm happy to take any questions that any of you have based on um, work that you're doing with Europe or have done with Europe in the past um, or new arrangements you're considering. Any questions? Oh, it looks like Anne has a question. Hi, David, thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation and I really appreciate it so much. Um, we are um, here in the dental school launching a collaborative project with Special Olympics. Special Olympics is based here in the US as an entity. Um, Special Olympics gathers health data through a series of well-established programs at, at every game, whether it's at the local level all the way through international games. And we um, are interested in doing a retrospective analysis on health data that was collected in Germany at the World Games this That's June. Good. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering how, obviously, this we're not going to be receiving any type of um, personal identifiers. In other words, the data set will be completely de-identified before we would even have access to that information. And I'm wondering since we're US-based entities, but we collected data from people all over the world, including Europe, mm -hmm. what your thoughts are about this navigation? Yeah, that's a good question. So who collected the data? Was it AT Still University or was it this um, organization that runs these games? the organization that runs the game. So there were volunteers. Um, so like health professionals in each discipline, you know, yeah. volunteer to screen the athletes. Got it. But are the games, is it like its own nonprofit organization? That's yes. 
Okay. I mean, so they would probably be seen as the controller of those data in the first instance. If they were collecting the data in Germany, they should have had some attention to GDPR in their collection of those data because there would have been, an, the games could probably be seen as an establishment in Germany, as we were talking about. And so what may happen is when they're transferring the data set to you, I know you said it's a de-identified data set, but if it's individual level data and there's mm -hmm. codes attached that like the nonprofit could re-identify it as being David, you know, like I said, that would probably be considered mm -hmm. synonymized data and still subject to GDPR. So the, I would really talk to them because they're providing you this data set about mm -hmm. how they've um, thought about GDPR compliance because they would really be in the best position to assess that since they're the ones that have collected it. But they might be wanting to put in place these standard contractual clauses I talked about um, to safeguard transfers of data from Germany to the U.S. Um, are they, is this organization based in the U.S.? Yeah, they're based in Washington, D.C. Yeah. So uh, there's a question in my mind about how they transfer any data from Germany to Washington, D.C., but I would really, you know, put that on them to really figure out in the first instance. And and just kind of along that lines too, because um, even though the event was in Germany, there were athletes from many European countries yeah. who were there. Yeah. And is there, to your knowledge, um, some type of comparable regulation, say in other parts of the world, say Asia or um, yeah. Australia yeah. or other places? A lot of countries have their own data privacy laws, like right. Brazil, People's Republic of China, Australia, Japan, um, that take inspiration from GDPR, but aren't exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for the purpose of your project, again, the organization that was organizing those games really should have been the one to think about compliance with privacy laws in the first instance. And so I'd figure out, one, you know, what did they do in that regard and what type of requirements are they trying to flow down to you now as recipients of this data set? Thank you so much. I appreciate the advice. My pleasure. Dr. Dagenhart, did you have a question? <clears throat> it looks like you're on mute if you're trying to ask it. Yeah, thank you, David. I just want to echo Anne's comments. This, this was just an amazing uh, presentation on clearly a complex uh, issue. I can't say that it answered everything, but at least it was understandable that uh, okay. on that front. So we we have been working with a variety of, of entities over the years, um, uh, particularly in G Germany. So educational institutions where we have collected uh, student performance data. Got it. Mm -hmm. and, and so some of that probably occurred before GDPR, but may have continued after GDPR started. Uh, and we may not have been aware of that. And, you know, we look at obviously evaluating and processing and disseminating outcomes from this data. Um, I assume, one, that we would have to make some statements within our reporting that we demonstrated compliance with this, like we do with IRB review and that type of thing. And... Does this is this grand is data grandfathered into this uh, law like things that may have been collected in 2017, 2016? Are these things that if we were to report them now, would there be expectations that GDP we would be GDPR compliant with that information? With data that were collected back in 2016 and 2017. Um, and you already are analyzing those data at AT still, like you've received them in the past. Um, generally, no, unless it's part of a continuing activity that continued after 2018 when GDPR took effect, which it sounds like it may have. But I think the question would be, again, we'd have to look at what your relationship was with the institutions in Germany where the data were collected to figure out you know, are you monitoring behavior? Are you offering good or service to people in Europe such that we should be providing like a GDPR notice to those people going forward? Um, so I think you'd have to analyze really like what the contractual arrangements are and the nature of the arrangement with the German entity. Okay. 
Well, thank you so much again, David. This is awesome. And unfortunately, we are two minutes over, so we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, but we will be posting and sending out the, the link um, if anybody is interested. And I know there are some colleagues that are were, were very interested, but were unable to attend. So we'll be getting um, the, the recording as well. So any final um, closing comments or anything for David? Well, thank you all. The questions were excellent. Thanks so much for attending. And thank you, Marie, for inviting me. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Take care. Have a good Bye, one. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye.